All right, so the series is Marriage Prep 101, Getting Ready for the Big Day, Lesson 5. Uh, top 10 marriage myths. Top 10 marriage myths. Even though these lessons address issues that are common in most relationships, uh, of course I'll be speaking about the marriage relationship the most since this is the most common form of male-female relationship that uh, people experience or they look forward to experience it or they have failed at it in some way, but everybody has had some sort of relationship uh, or experience rather with a marriage relationship. So when you read about marriage or you hear discussions about the subject, uh, maybe at work or you know, with your friends, it's amazing how much of this information is false and misguided. In our day and age, marriage, especially the Christian concept of marriage, you know, what we call sacred marriage, is greatly misunderstood. So in this session, we're going to examine some of these misunderstandings and lay some groundwork and establish the unique view of marriage contained uh, in the Bible. It seems that uh, society today doesn't pay a whole lot of attention to God's original design for sacred marriage. And that negligence is reflected in surveys done that study the relationship between religion and marriage. For example, one such survey by a Professor Bradley Wright, sociologist at the University of Connecticut, found that nominal Christians who rarely attend church, you know, you know who those are, they, they say, they'll fill out a hospital form and they'll say, what, your religion, and they'll put Christian. But they rarely go to church and they, you know, they don't read their Bible, they don't have a lot of spiritual life. Anyways, uh, this uh, researcher said those individuals, uh, nominal Christians who rarely attend church, have a 60% divorce rate as opposed to regular church attending believers who had a 38% divorce rate among the group that he studied. The percentages continue to drop as factors for regular Bible reading and prayer and involvement by both partners in church were accounted for. So they start with the nominal Christian and then the, he, he kind of added things. So how about, how about Christians who pray regularly? How about Christians who go to church regularly? How about Christians who are involved and give at church? You know, and he kept adding, and as he added those factors to the portrait, the uh, percentage of divorce among those people went down, down, uh, and down. So uh, greater commitment to the faith and the church resulted in his study in stronger marriages. Among other things, the survey showed that God's design for marriage and his involvement in the partner's lives make a great difference in the potential success of the relationship. I mean, God answers a prayer like, dear God, please help my marriage or please help me be a better husband. I mean, those are the kind of prayers that, that God will, uh, will, uh, will answer and of course, uh, these type of prayer make a great difference in the potential success of the relationship. Our society has come up with so many strange ideas about marriage. Uh, in a book entitled Married People Staying Together in the Age of Divorce, author Francine Clagburn outlines 10 of the worst myths that many people accept as true about marriage. Of course, her myths are found mostly among non-Christian couples, but these ideas nevertheless influence a great majority of people in our society. So very quickly, the top 10 marriage myths according to this uh, author. Myth number one, living together before marriage helps the relationship. Many times have you heard that? Well, how do we know if we're set and good for one another if we don't live together first? Now remember, Francine Clagsburn is not a Christian writer. And yet in her research, she sees this common, seemingly harmless argument as a myth and ultimately dangerous for the good health of a marriage. She comments that living together, the living together experience 
does not improve the chances of a successful relationship. Oh, some of these relationships, <clears throat> she says, succeed to a point, or they succeed in spite of this arrangement, but not because of it. It's not success because we lived together before we got married. It's success despite the fact that this was the case. Um, the idea is that the easy attitude of temporary commitment is often transferred to the marriage itself. The author claims that couples who live together before marriage are at a greater risk of divorce than those who wait to be married before they live together. And we can show scriptures that condemn this practice, but it's a real eye opener that even non-religious counselors don't see the great benefit of this type of arrangement. Myth number nine, have an affair in order to breathe new life into your marriage. <laughs> How many times have you seen this as a theme in a movie or a book? You know, I'll cause my partner to be jealous and hurt and this will make them love me more <laughs> somehow. Of course, in marriage, solutions to problems never come from outside of the relationship, especially immoral and hurtful solutions. No one is ever provoked to love by being hurt and humiliated. That's not the way to improve your marriage. Of course, Christians wouldn't consider this for obvious reasons, but many do, and they suffer for it. Oh yeah, I'll show them. I, I'm going to start flirting. I'm going to start doing things to make him jealous. Boy, that'll really, he'll really love me then. Myth number eight, be prepared for sex to get boring. How come, you know, how come people think this is true and yet they love to go bowling for 40 years. You know, they go bowling for 40 years, but they think, oh, sex, that'll get boring. But bowling, oh man, that's just so much fun, year after year after year. This myth promotes fear of commitment among men and discouragement among women. I mean, why get married if sex is going to get boring? Why do, you, why do your best? if my sex life will not be fulfilling. This is a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy in couples' marriage. The truth is that when you actually work at it, you can expect sex to become more exciting, more completely fulfilling, more creative. You know, sex remains a vital part of a couple's marriage and if they're determined to keep their romance and their sex life active and new and fresh and creative. We'll get into this a little more deeply as we go into our series, but as far as the myth is concerned, people believe this. Myth number seven, keep your independence. The idea, this idea is especially popular today among both men and women who don't want to lose their sense of independence, even if they're married. But becoming dependent is an important component of a successful marriage. Too much independence in a marriage leaves a person feeling unneeded, unimportant. The goal is to become lovingly dependent without becoming codependent. That's a whole other thing. Myth number six, if your spouse really loves you, he or she will know what you want and need. Meaning they'll know without asking you, they'll just know it. Well, they'll know what you need and what you want if they're mind readers, if they have that gift, if they can just read your mind, too many people see the test of true love as their partner's ability to discern what they want or need. But this is unrealistic and it's not fair. In successful marriages, the partners usually take great care in patiently explaining and reinforcing what they want and what they need to feel loved. 
to be happy. It's not being over needy to share with your partner the things that you need to be fulfilled and satisfied as an individual, as a, as a marriage partner. Myth number five, keep the peace at all costs. Some people spend most of their married lives avoiding an argument or a scene. They'd rather live quietly than honestly. Such an approach is basically dishonest. And in the end, it produces resentment. A willingness to acknowledge conflict or failure or unhappiness is the first step to improving the relationship. Look, I know you've been making apple pie every weekend to please me because my mom said I loved apple pie. But after 14 years, I need to confess to you, I despise apple pie. I never told my mother I didn't like her apple pie. And so she told you I liked apple pie. And now I'm sorry, I can't take it anymore. I hate apple pie. Please stop making apple pie for me. <laughs> what a relief that will be. And then she said, Whew, I'm so glad you told me because I hate making apple pie. You know, you know. The next myth is the opposite to this myth. Myth number four, always say what's on your mind. You know, it's good to be honest, but not when your frankness or openness is simply an excuse for destructive criticism. In any relationship, tenderness and tact should always accompany openness and honesty. I'm not saying that the apple pie you make is bad apple pie. I'm just saying I don't like anybody's apple pie, not just your apple pie, I, even the best apple pie maker in the world. I wouldn't like apple pie because I don't like apples, you know. Oh, this one, this one's a good one. I love this one. You can change your partner. Well, you can if they want to change. When I'm doing a marriage prep course, I used to do this when I worked at Oklahoma Christian. They had this big, uh, you know, they, of course, uh, in a college, in a university, a lot of people get engaged. So there would there'd be 40, 50, 60 couples every, uh, you know, sem every spring semester, there'd be a bunch of couples that would be engaged and uh, the school would um, put on a marriage prep course and different people would kind of you know, di give different classes to help these young engaged couple prepare for marriage. And uh, I would do a couple of these sessions and when I would be doing one of these, um, I would at one point say, okay, I want everybody to put your pencils down, blah, blah, blah. And I said, you may be arm in arm or you may be sitting next to, I said, I want you to put your chairs, and turn and just face each other. I'm not asking you to do that here, but I would tell them, turn around and face each other and just look at each other. Look at each other you know, face to face. And of course, there'd be some giggling and a little embarrassing. You know, I'd say, go ahead, look at each other. And while they would be looking at each other, I would say the following. You better be happy and love what you are now looking at because this is pretty much what you're going to end up with. You better be satisfied with what you're looking at because this is what you got. So if you have an angry, jealous boyfriend, he's going to become an angry, jealous husband. If you have a lazy and dishonest girlfriend, well, she's going to have the same faults when she becomes your wife. Marriage challenges you to change and grow but it does not automatically make you a better person or turn your partner into the person you want them to be. Just because they say, I do, doesn't mean I do want to do everything you want me to do. <laughs> that doesn't, that's not what that means. Myth number two. Oh, I like this one also. I, this is a good one. 
A baby will bring you together. And especially these young couples that are living together. And she decides, you know what, I think I'm just going to skip taking my pill because you know, if we have a baby, that'll probably bring the boy over the line. You know? Finally, it'll get him to commit. You know? Bad strategy. Here's a rule of thumb about babies. Having children will magnify everything good or bad about your relationship. Babies create stress. And they create stress on the happiest of marriages and usually cause casual relationships to disintegrate. You can't always plan for babies, but you can prepare for them by cultivating strong and committed relationships. And then of course, and in the, in the, I don't have it here, but in the course, the big course where a lot of people, I had a soundtrack that, that went on when this slide came up. Love is all you need. And the Beatles would be singing, love is all you need, you know. Love is all you need. It's a myth. Love is important, but sexual, sensual, emotional love is only one of many ingredients in a successful marriage. In order to create a sacred marriage, biblical marriage, you also need a strong dose of commitment, maturity, and this thing called sacrifice. You see, being attracted is the easy part. Staying attracted and bonded is what requires effort. All right, now that we've dealt with the myths, let's examine God's original plan for marriages that really work. So when examining God's design for marriage contained in the Bible, you're going to notice that there are two elements or two features of his basic design. One, element number one, the people that are involved. In Genesis 2, 18, we read, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I'll make him a helper suitable for him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that uh, was its name. Verse 20, the man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field, but for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. So the first element about God's design um, are the people involved. Notice that after man was created, he realized from his understanding of the creation around him that he was different in nature to the animals that shared the creation with him. It says he named the animals and in the Hebrew, it wasn't just, okay, you're a horse and you're a cow and you're the, it's the idea that he knew, he knew essentially what that animal was and where it fit into the scheme of things, all right? And so the idea here is that he, he witnesses God's physical creation of uh, sentient creatures, animals, you know? And the realization he comes to is, I'm not like these guys. These are all wonderful and they're marvelous, you know, and they show God's power and everything, but there's nothing out there that's like me. I don't see anything like me. And so in verse 21 and 22 we read, so the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and he slept. And then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. So then God creates another human being suitable for partnership with Adam. And so we see here that God purposefully fashions another human being like Adam in nature, but different in composition. She's called woman. So the term used to describe her is help meet which comes from two words. The first word help or azar, 
uh, in the Hebrew means to surround, to protect, to aid. And the term meet means corresponding to, similar, similar as. So man is created in the image and the glory of God. Woman is created in the image and glory of man. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse seven. So in the pre-sin world of Adam and Eve, there was no conflict. There was no problem of understanding of God's order of creation. Both Adam and Eve were glorious in the eyes of each other. Okay. Now after the advent of sin, however, God had to impose order in order to avoid sexual anarchy and destruction. Because of sinfulness, the uh, unregenerated men and women see only weakness in one another, not glory. In sinful men and women, there is the effort to exploit and dominate each other rather than cleave and unite. For this reason, we go back to God's original design for marriage in order to establish the framework that will support a lifetime of loving a relationship. And so when examining this design, we see that the number one element in this design is that we begin with the basic unit of one man and one woman to constitute a marriage in God's eyes. Now, there are many marriage styles permitted and promoted in this world. There are uh, group uh, marriages, you know, one man and many women. We call it polygamy. Um, I insert a little modern history here. The next legal challenge. Uh, you wait and see. I, I, I remember, you know, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, when I was preaching, I said. Wait and see, you're going to see the leaders of this country marching to defend the rights of homosexuals. Ah, get out of here, that'll never happen. Yeah, watch. So now I'm telling you, here's the next challenge coming down the line, okay? Challenge to traditional marriage. The thinking goes like this. Well, wait a minute. If same-sex marriage is legal, and it is, I mean, if two men can marry each other legally, and we ought to accept it, and we're bigots if we don't, we're haters if we don't, or two women can marry each other, okay? Well, then why not two women and a man and another man and two other women? Why can't four people go together and create a married state? This newest trend is called polyamory, many loves. Polyamory, it's a group relationship and it's both gay and straight. In other words, it's a mixture of gay and straight females and males together in one marriage relationship. They're married. This is the next challenge that's coming down the line that we will begin seeing and reading about and dealing with in the courtroom. Because you know, we've, already broken, we've already broken the sacred base, which is one man and one woman. Well, so now if two men could be married, why not some other thing? I mean, they've always been trying to lower the age of consent you know, from 18 to 16 to 14. Why not a 30-year-old man and a 13-year-old woman? Why not? A girl actually, okay? So we have open marriages, you know, swingers. We have, uh, of course, nowadays, gay marriages, common law marriages, where there's no legal bond. So all of these styles may be permitted in one society or another, but they don't conform to God's original design for marriage described in the Bible, what I call a sacred marriage. So you're living together and you're committed to one another. You, you never kind of uh, legalized it, but you love each other. You, you may even have children together, you know. And people will say, well, how dare you 
you know, not call that a marriage. I'm saying, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that those two people don't love each other. I'm not even suggesting that they're not committed to each other. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is, what that thing is, it's not a sacred marriage. It's a common law marriage. It's a marriage of sorts. And if it works for you, oh, fine. But please don't call it a sacred marriage. Because a sacred marriage is the highest form of commitment where we commit ourselves legally before God to be husband and wife. That's the highest form of commitment that exists in our, in our society. And that as Christians, that's what we promote. We say nothing less than that is acceptable in God's eyes. And so the first element or feature in God's design for marriage is one man, one woman who are committed before God and man, meaning a legal commitment, to live as husband and wife. The second element, so that's the first element, one man, one woman. The second element is the covenant. This is the feature in God's design for marriage. It always contains a covenant. Now, verse 23 and 24 in Genesis, these verses express the details contained in the original marriage covenant between Adam and Eve. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman because she's taken out of, out of man. So the first element of the covenant is respect and honor. A woman is equal in nature and value to a man. She may have a different role in the marriage, but she's equal. Verse 24a, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother. And so a change in priorities and responsibility is agreed upon by both partners, which means there's a new commitment. Before I was committed to my parents, my home family, as a son, as a daughter, but now that I'm married, I have a new commitment that precedes my, uh, my other commitment. Uh, and then in verse 24b, it says, and they be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. The marriage union is exclusive. In this way, Adam and Eve expressed their marriage vows to the only legal authority possible at that time, that was God himself. Interestingly, God and the angels were also the witnesses of this contract or covenant between, between Adam uh, and Eve. And so what constitutes a marriage between a man and a woman is the covenant, the contract, the promise that they have made to one another. That's what makes them married. Therefore, what makes a man and a woman married is not sex, it's the covenant. Otherwise, you'd be married to everyone you've ever had sex with. That doesn't make any sense. For Adam and Eve, it was a spoken covenant before God. In our society, it's the exchange of vows and a written contract before a representative of the government, clergyman, a judge, something, justice of the peace. And every society has some form of this covenant making that seals a marriage commitment between a man and a woman, every society, even primitive societies, you know, a dowry has to be paid and you know, whatever. So if there's a house and there's sex and there are joint bank accounts, but no covenant, then there's no sacred marriage before God. You know, buying a house together isn't what makes you married. In God's design for marriage set forth in the Bible, there are two main elements. One man, one woman who freely choose to enter into a marriage with each other, along with a legal covenant and contract laying out the terms of their agreement to marry. So one question here, we're almost, we're almost done. One question here, why this design? Well, aside from the fact that it is God's design, the plan is fairly simple to understand but in its simplicity, it manages to serve. This, this design right here, one man, one woman with the covenant, 
It serves us as human beings very well. For example, it serves us emotionally. In Proverbs it says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains a favor from the Lord. You know, man needs companionship. And I don't, I don't mean males, I mean man, mankind. Men and women were not created to be alone. This was not God's purpose. The Bible says that those who live the single life and they do so without problems are able to do so because God has given them a special gift. And they don't even need to believe in God. I know people who don't believe in God but who have the ability to just you know, be single. We had a, a friend of ours, he's passed away now, uh, Mike Toby, remember Mike Toby? Uh, he was an opera singer and he was also a preacher. <laughs> And uh, he earned his living by preaching for this small church in Ontario. And uh, he would do regional theater and he, was, he had a beautiful voice. He was a tenor and he sang and so on and so forth. And he wasn't married, never had a girlfriend, wasn't interested, you know. And uh, we talked once privately. He says, you know, people think I'm gay, but I'm not. He said, you know, he says, I just, I don't have the desire to have a relationship with a woman. I have no desire to have a family or anything like that. He says, I'm, I, I have many friends, I have nephews. He says, I have a full life. I have the Lord, I have my work, I have my ministry. He says, I'm quite a content person. Yeah, that's a gift, you know? Good, you know, good for you, it's not the way I would want to live. But I mean, he was able to live in that way and he would say, I don't have to struggle you know, with sexual desires and unfulfilled sexual desires. I don't, I don't struggle with those things. Well, good. And, and how good is God? How old was he, 52, something like that? You know, he died in his sleep when he was 52. His heart stopped and he died in his sleep. You know how good God is. You know, he didn't even live to be old and you know, by, him, by himself. And so even though the single life is possible, many people live and honor God with the single life. Married life is the one that we are designed for and we are encouraged to pursue whenever possible. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains a favor from the Lord. Absolutely, but that works both ways. She who finds a husband obtains a favor from the Lord. Why is this design or why this design? It serves us emotionally. It also serves us physically and sexually. In Genesis 2.24 it says, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. So within marriage our powerful sex drive is translated into a wonderful and meaningful experience. Within marriage we share love given, love received in the most dynamic, mysteriously wonderful way possible. We're comforted without words. We enjoy pleasure without guilt. While the sex drive is within us alone, it's unfulfilled. All it is is a powerful force. When expressed within marriage, it has the ability to build our relationship and create something healthy and something meaningful. Sex within marriage creates family, which serves not only ourselves, but it serves society as well. Family fulfills our need to belong, our need to not be alone. And all of these things are provided within marriage without guilt or shame because the covenant that created the commitment for life came before the sexual intimacy. People's sex drives with marriage are troubled because they violate this principle. You know, not only preachers, but many counselors tell us that the biggest problems with sex inside of marriage is that there's too much sex outside of marriage. And then marriage serves us spiritually by helping us to serve God. In Genesis 1:28, uh, the writer says, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the seas and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Adam and Eve served God by managing the garden. The true objective of marriage, believe it or not, is not paying off the mortgage. 
It's not even educating the kids or retiring in security financially. God created marriage so that men and women within marriage could render honor and service to God as partners. So this brings us back to our original survey and what it proves. <clears throat> Marriages that didn't recognize and serve God had a terribly high risk of failure. However, the more people recognized and served God, the greater happiness they had in their marriage. Remember those, uh, <clears throat> remember those divorce statistics, keep those divorce statistics in mind. So what's the point of all of this? Just, you know, stuff to pack up and take home. If you're not married, if you're an unmarried person, make sure you use God's plan because if you do, you'll have a much greater chance of success. And if you are married, if you have trouble, then review the plan to make sure it is still operating in your relationship. All right, well obviously, can't cover everything about marriage in 10 to 30 minutes here. But some of the myths anyways, uh, you, you still hear to this day people spouting these uh, marriage myths. Next week we're going to talk about uh, now that we're together, what actually changes when we get married? What, what actually changes? We're going to talk about that next week. All right, thank you for your attention. I appreciate it.